Keith McPeak. Okay, Keith is way too modest to tell you guys this, so I'm going to tell you. Keith, first person, private person, to breed both greens and Mandarin Sanzinia, right? Yep. Uh, first person, you actually created the Marble Bloods and the Ghost Bloods, and right. his wife, Teresa, actually gave them the names of uh, Marble yeah. and... and uh, in Ghost, yes, and doing amazing work with Bowen's pythons, and I'm going to see if I can't get Keith to take out a Bowen's python later. But with all his accomplishments, Keith, and all the things you've done in herpetoculture today, I think what people really want to know is like, like, what do you like most about me, <laughs> Gary? What, Keith? Keith, where you go? Just like your top three things. Video number 27, everybody, and I am so excited for this video. I have so much stuff going on in this one. You just sit back and relax and enjoy this video. Keith McPeak is going to be joining us today. If you do not know who Keith McPeak is, you need to know who Keith McPeak is. You need to follow him on Facebook. I'm going to put his information down below so you can follow Keith on Facebook. Arguably one of the best, greatest minds we have in reptiles today. I mean that sincerely. I just admire him and everything he does with these animals. His passion is incredible. After all these years of keeping animals, his passion never wanes. And uh, he's one of my go-to guys. When I have northern animal tree boas, I need help with them. I go right to Keith. And today we're going to be talking about how to keep northerns properly from feeding regimen to prey size to humidity to heat. We're going to cover everything for everybody out there who either has a northern emerald tree boa right now or is even thinking about getting a northern tree boa right now. Hey, as an added bonus, when I visited Keith, we also took out one of his Bowens pythons. That's a major passion project for Keith right now as well. So we're going to get into the world of Bowens pythons for a little bit. I know you guys are going to enjoy that. Um, so what else do I have going on for you? Well, in the last two weeks since I saw you guys, I had a bunch of babies hatch out. I had a bunch of, I had another litter board of uh, some sand boas. I had a bunch of females ovulating. I just have a ton of stuff going on as far as my breeding year this year. So I'm really excited to share that with you guys. And I think the first thing we're going to jump into is uh, my Savu Python project. Liasis savuensis, better known as a Savu Python. There's so many cool Liasis species out there. And I got to tell you, being an arboreal guy, I never really paid attention to Liasis before. And in fact, until Savu Pythons, I didn't know my Liasis from a hole in the ground. Oh! Uh, thank you, Andrew Mice Clay, for that. Hey, these are my two silver Savu Pythons. You know what's so awesome, guys? I know you're watching my channel. You've been following the story with me. But this year, not only do I have one Savu female python that ovulated, not do I have two, not even three, but I have four female Savu Pythons that recently ovulated. These are my two silver Savu Pythons. In fact, I have... Three Savu Python ovulations occur within the last 48 hours. What's so cool about that, guys, what I'm most proud of is that this is a species that it's pretty much wiped out where it's from, the island of Savu. And even in the hobby, it's pretty much all but disappeared. And what's so cool about them, they're basically like an Antaricia species in that they stay so small, three to four feet. Four feet would be a big female. They go through an onogenic color change, and they're just really awesome species to work with. So these are silvers, and I'm really hoping to produce this year normals, and I'm hoping to produce het for silver. Silvers are a simple recessive trait. And I'm also hoping to produce actual silver babies this year, so keep my keep your fingers crossed for me. And a lot of you, tons of you out there, have been reaching out to me, wanting to know availability and wanting to know pricing on these animals. So I thought I'd give some thought to the pricing structure on these, and I'm going to put up a slide for those who might be interested in getting some Savu pythons from me this year. Hey guys, so it's uh, it's Monday evening right now, but it was Saturday morning two days ago, and I was checking out my incubator, looking at my spotted python eggs, just checking on, see how things were going, and all of a sudden I see some babies crawling around. I'm like, wait, how can that be? It's only day 43. These things aren't due to hatch out for another seven, at least seven days, right? Um, but these animals always keep us guessing. I double-checked my thermometers, and I... Checked my thermostat and everything was perfect. It was at 87.4. I have actually two thermometers in there. One was 87.4, the other one was 87.8. And lo and behold, even after only 43 days, I got a tub full of baby granite spotted pythons. So that's super fast. I've definitely hatched pythons in less than 50 to, at less than 50 days. Like green tree pythons usually hatch out for me about 49 days. My children's pythons hatch out about 46 days, but 43 days is definitely the quickest any python species has hatched out for me, but that's usually the case, right? The smaller the snake, typically the faster, or the shorter the incubation period. But super healthy babies. Um, looks, I had a total of 18 eggs when I started. It looks like a 13 or 14 total babies hatched out. They have good weight on them. They're just super small. It's really hard for me to try to lift one up and focus it on them for you guys, but they're just like super small. And um, yeah, so in about another 
let's say nine to fourteen days, all these guys will shed. I'll get them going on. Uh, first, I'll try frozen thawed pinkies warmed up. I usually have much better luck with frozen thawed pinky mice than live pinky mice. Believe it or not, you think it would be the opposite. But and I took out the water and I incubate. I basically I just had them no substrate method incubation. So I had them floating over the water, eighty-seven point four degrees. I I incubate all my eggs the same temperature, eighty-seven point four degrees. Whether it's Angolan pythons or Savu pythons, carpet pythons, green tree pythons. Children's pythons, everything to me is the same thing. 87.4 degrees, they all hatch. They look great, and uh, once the first one started to pip, I got rid of all the water. I put them on damp paper towels. You can see they all look to be out. Anyway, great little snakes. Max size, you're talking on these guys about uh, three foot at most. And, um, yeah, so granite spot is just a simple recessive trait. Super, you know, it's just a more for a simple recessive trait of a normal spot of python. So I get these babies set up. And, uh, but again, day 43, these animals always keep us guessing. All right, Keith, so let's start out. We're under the assumption that somebody has either a nice captive bred and born emerald tree boa or an imported baby that was, you know, produced by a gravid female. So we're starting out on the premise that you watching at home the video, um, that you have a established baby and you're looking to set up that baby. So Keith, first we're going to start out by how you would set up a, um, a baby emerald Keith. So I think the first thing we have to say, is make the obvious, is that we do not have a baby emerald tree boa, so we're going to use this. Amazon tree bow. What phase is that, Keith? Oh, uh, that's a tiger phase. Okay, yeah, I love that animal. So we can't get a good filming over that. It's just starting to go through its uh, color change now. Okay, so let's talk about the setup, Keith. So let's pretend this is a northern baby emerald and the setup is going to be identical, correct? Yes. So what I like to do is I like to have removable perches, obviously, so that I don't stress the animal when I'm going to clean the enclosure. Mm -hmm. I can take the kit, this out, I can put it um, on a stand, Anything, yeah. clean the enclosure, put the animal back in. And it causes the minimal right. stress. To the no animal. stress to the animal. So, and as far as like, what do you think the temperature, Keith? You, um, I closer? keep. I do ambient with my all my corallis, mm -hmm. and I do 84 uh, degrees as a maximum. And at night, I'll let it go down to 75 to 78. Okay. I like fluctuation. I don't like consistency in temperatures. Um, humidity level typically I like babies especially in the 70 to 75 percent okay range um do you spray them down at all I keith do, i do mist and okay. i'm not you, afraid to splash a little water on the uh, bottom for okay for so i was going to ask you when you missed you actually you don't you miss the animal and the enclosure yes okay got yes. it um okay. hydration is probably one of the most important things for mm -hmm. emerald tree boas as you can see, I keep a very large water bowl underneath the perch. Yeah. Um, uh, this animal yeah. obviously is too big for this container, but a baby emerald will coil in its hunting position and naturally just find that water every night yeah. when it's hunting. So I like to keep a big water bowl right underneath the perch so that, that animal's always finding water. Yeah. And I noticed too, Keith, the perch is, um, you know, you keep it really thin for a baby emerald, correct? Yes, okay. correct. I, I actually use... Um, uh, hangers that you can buy at Walmart. Yep. I cut them and then I hot glue them together so that they fit and wedge in the enclosure. Okay, but we got to remember my friend David at Specialty Design, Specialty Enclosure Designs, David Brahms Perches, I use in all my enclosures and they're just awesome. Trust me, the hangers absolutely work, but just if anybody's looking for some convenience. So Keith, now let's talk about feeding with a baby. Um, like, so let's pretend again, does the baby nor the number we're, we're looking at. So are we feeding uh, pinky mice or fuzzy mice? Um, well, I find actually that um, first I will try a fuzzy off of forceps and usually a live fuzzy as the first meal. Mm -hmm. Even if I acquired the animal from somebody else, I do that specifically just to get a feeding response, get a meal in the animal and let it set. But most importantly, don't even attempt to try doing this till the animal's been in your care for at least two weeks. Getting just let it settle to, in. Yeah, let yeah. it settle in, get used to the rhythm of your room, how you act in the room. Just let them settle in and then always feed the first time at night also um, because that is when you're going to get your most aggressive right. feeding responses. And if you're feeding frozen, Keith, I would assume maybe try to heat up the prey item a little bit. Yeah, typically, okay. uh, you know, we'll I'll actually thaw them out in warm water or you can even use a hair dryer on it okay. and get it uh, pretty, pretty warm. What if somebody like me doesn't have a hair dryer, Keith? You had, that sounds like yeah. a low, that sounds like we'll a, like, may, may, maybe we'll like you're making fun water. of me a little bit. Yeah. Um, all right. So how about how often are you going to feed the baby emerald? So uh, with the babies, they do process a little bit faster than the adults I've found because I'm keeping them generally a little bit warmer than the adults. Mm -hmm. 
um, but definitely no more than every seven to ten days and okay. you definitely would like to have a defecation before you feed again. Okay, so what if, like I'm under the old school, Keith, where I typically won't feed my emeralds, um, even the babies, like if I don't see at least one defecation, I'll, I'll, max I'll feed is like three meals before yeah, I'll see. You, you agree with that? Yeah, you, okay. you can actually see it building in the animal and when that animal's starting to get that full look, you know it's mm -hmm. time to back off. And um, definitely wait for that defecation before you feed again. Okay. And just one last question. If you said it already, I apologize. But as far as feeding the size of the meal, you said fuzzy mice, correct? Um, well, I'll offer fuzzy mice first because um, we could talk about this in a, in a bit. But I like to offer a smaller prey to an unknown animal that I'm not familiar with first. Okay. So I'll go with a fuzzy, but typically I'll get a better feeding response if I use a live hopper mouse. Got if it. it's a new animal that hasn't been conditioned to my ways yet. Got it. All right, so that was great. So now now that we've talked about, you know, a baby northern emerald, let's talk about the next step. It's not just like a, maybe a, just a young emerald between the ages of a baby and an adult. So let's take a look at that right now. So Keith, I noticed same exact setup, but a much larger animal. So what are we, what kind of, what are we looking at here as far as age, Keith? So this is a three-year-old, and it's a new locale animal, yes. and then you can see the white spots on the head, mm -hmm. uh, which give it the name the new locale. Yeah, it's a beautiful um, animal, and it's about three years old. Yeah. Okay, but the most important thing I'm noticing is that despite the much being a much larger animal, it's really the identical setup that you had the uh, the much younger animal, and so again, I see the perch set up. As far as, let's talk about, are you spraying this enclosure down, Keith, at all? Um, usually, once they get to this size, I don't need to, to do any more misting at this point. Okay. Um, for purposes of moving the container, I kept the water low, but typically I'll keep that water bowl right up to the top. Okay. Again, so when that animal is hunting, it's just coming in contact with that water constantly. And um, as long as they're getting hydrated a lot, I haven't found a big need for uh, misting, but that's okay. my collection. Somebody else's collection right. may require it. And we're depending on where you live in different parts of the country or in other Winter, countries. Winter, summer, yeah. it all affects the I see that on Facebook quite a bit. People talking about it. I don't miss, and people say I do. Well, it depends what part of the country you're in as well. I mean, it gets pretty dry here in New Jersey, yeah. especially when uh, in the winter when the heat comes on and dries the entire room out. Yeah. So as far as, let's talk about um, feeding frequency, Keith, and as far as f uh, size of the prey that you're feeding. Once the animal is, uh, I'm going to say, uh, eight months to a year old, I, I, I switch back to typical 14 days. Okay. Um, and it will be every 14 days. Um, and again, you want to find that defecation and make sure the animal is going to the bathroom properly um, because you can definitely overload an emerald and cause all kinds of problems for yourself if you overfeed okay. and not let it um, expel its waste. And um, I, I, I will say... Um, as far as, I know every animal is different, but when do you think, so you have a baby emerald, let's call it, when do you think it's actually about old enough to start taking an adult-sized mouse? Again, I know there's a lot of variables, but roughly. When yeah, you uh, it's funny because you could be feeding two animals exactly the same, and as you know, you've raised a lot of animals. One animal will grow faster than the other. So um, typically, I'm not on an adult mouse until... Um, the animal is about a year old, mm -hmm. and if you can get them on to rat fuzzies, actually, or, or rat pups is actually even better. They get seem to do a lot better and grow a okay. lot faster if you get them on that. Okay. So, again, how, now how often are you feeding this emerald? Uh, this animal is fed every 14 days. Every 14 days, and you're waiting for a, you'd feed up again, like three meals? You'd say? Three meals max before I would uh, back off and um, watch the animal, make sure Just it's defecating. It. Again, misting is a good stimulant to get mm -hmm. a defecation, and in worst case scenario, if you really see your animals having a problem and really building in the back end, swimming the animal um, yeah. usually always gets the animal to defecate. Yeah, that's definitely the biggest problem with arboreals in general. I plan to do a video on that in the future, just getting the animals to defecate, little tricks we can do, because um, yeah, some animals just defecate on a regular basis, and for whatever reason, and this being in the same room, same environments, some just want to hold it. Absolutely. Um, want to show us like the prey size you'd be feeding in this animal, Keith? Yeah, so th so this animal here, again, is about a three-year-old. As you can see, really, uh, an established emerald is more of a shy animal than an aggressive animal. Yeah. Um, they tend to hide their heads like a ball python, actually. Um, but this animal would uh, be feeding on a rat um, this size, maybe even a little bit larger. Okay. Um, I think sometimes people feed too small to their established emeralds. Yeah. You can see this animal has nice fat, fat in the head, which means it's, it's storing the fat properly, but it's also not an obese animal. Yeah. Um, 
and he's growing at a good pace. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm a chondro guy, and I've always heard the horror stories, especially with northern animals with regurgitation. So I'm probably yeah. guilty of probably feeding too. Underfeeding. Yeah, yeah, underfeeding. And I don't know, Keith, hold that rodent up again. So you guys probably can't tell, but that's a um, that's a weaned rat, I think I would call that size. Yes. And if I had a guess, an approximation on that emerald's weight, I'm going to say that's probably like a six to 700 gram animal, maybe 800 gram animal. Something along those lines. So that would just kind of put things in perspective. But again, as you notice, that not much has changed since the being between a baby and a young emerald. You're still following the same feeding regimens for the most part. Well, a baby is feeding a little more frequently, but it's the same setup. Humidity levels are the same. And again, temperature on this, Keith, I don't know if we said um, that. I do ambient at 84 okay. um, in the room during the day. Um, and the animals will either gravitate um, my room setup so this end of the this tub would be warmer than the back end, so the you can kind of see what they're doing. Yeah. Got it. All right, so let's take out an adult emerald now. Okay, so Keith just took out one of his adults. And one thing I want to say about Keith is that, I mean, I don't even know. Keith, you don't even know how many litters of northern emeralds you've produced no, at this I point. Don't. And he I produces don't. northern emeralds. It's pretty crazy, and his animals are incredible. Just, again, that new... What do they call it, Keith? The new, new locale. New locality animal, yeah. Beautiful animal. But again, so let's look at the setup. This is an adult animal. How, what's the age on this one, you think, Keith? Uh, this one's like four and a half years old. So four and a half years old. If I had to put a gram size on this one, guys, I know it's tough looking at the video. I'm going to say this animal is probably in the, God, I bet that's about 1,200 gram range. Maybe a little bigger than that. Maybe even 1,400 grams. It's a nice size. It looks much bigger than my, you know, my average adult female chondro, I can tell you that. So, like Keith, let's talk about the enclosure again. It's basically the same duplication. It's the basic thing, yeah. just growing up in size. Yep. And if I do have emeralds, uh, females will get really large sometimes. So I have even a, the next size tub that mm -hmm. I'll keep them in. I do use tubs mainly because, for me, the ease of cleaning, humidity, everything works yeah. out really well just for me. I've tried cages in the past. And for me, in my setup, my conditions, yep. I always had issues with prolapsing. Yep. Once I went to tubs, those issues That's, went away. You know what? So. I noticed the same thing with me, Keith. I keep my conjures. I raise them in all the water as a substrate and that's what it comes down to you know we all everybody loves the idea of um the uh, the natural enclosures right with the plants and everything and we all understand that we love it but it's really difficult to manage the parameters and as simplistic as this looks it is so effective and keith you even you even breed your animals in these enclosures yes. correct yeah you yes. even breeds them in them yeah. and again ambient room temperature on these you said like 84 degrees keith? 84 degrees um and that night again it, it, it can drop down to 75 okay uh, 78 degrees okay and, uh, and feeding frequency on an adult uh, now? An adult, um, you know, I'm, f I'm feeding an animal um, this size, this size rat. Okay. Um, which a, is larger than most people probably yeah, think of with I'm gonna an I'm going to call that a medium rat. I don't know how many grams it is. I'm going to call that a medium rat, but you can see the animal and the rat together. You can kind of get a sense of that. And how, how often, Keith? And that'll be every two weeks, okay. um, every, you know, 14 to 17 days. Okay. Um, and that definitely a larger, less frequent feeding regime seems to be better with the emeralds yeah. than um obviously you don't want to do small frequent meals with an emerald uh, lar yeah. a larger meal less frequently definitely does the animal a lot better do you think um you find yourself feeding your females more frequently than your males or about the same no i feed them about the same but i definitely vary the size of the prey uh the females just have a much bigger bulkier head and I'll give them actually just a little bit larger of a rat at every feeding than mm -hmm. I would uh, a male of the same size. Even. Okay. So I think I think we could close out this segment by asking um, if you just thought of like some of the key things just as far as in general, Keith, as far as care of northern emeralds. Uh, any advice for people? Uh, I think the biggest thing that you really want to key in on is hydration. Yeah. Uh, and proper prey size yep. and frequency yep. of meals. That's it. Those are the three things. Yeah, because just like with chondros, guys, the things we're trying to eliminate, we're trying to eliminate um, prolapses and we're trying to uh, eliminate um, regurgitation. Those are the two key things. But I think the most important thing I want to come out of this segment is that, you know, you don't need some fancy elaborate setup. Um, these are nice size enclosures. These animals can easily roam around in these enclosures. I do keep my animals in enclosures, but I guarantee if you look at the square you know, inches as far as, you know, size of the tub compared to my enclosures is probably not that different. Um, high humidity, I keep water tubs in my enclosures and allows the animals to move around, high hydration, and I, I think that's the key. But I think the last thing Keith will leave people on is, you know, these are not ball pythons or carpet pythons. I think the best advice I can give people to is just leave them alone as much yes, as possible. absolutely. That's why removable perches yeah. are key. Yeah. Um, so you're not 
not handling the animal and um, they don't handle stress well they don't handle they stress don't well. and you, sometimes you can't even tell they're stressed but they are stressed yeah. okay so good morning guys it's about six o'clock in the morning i just came down into the room checking for ovulation checking for eggs checking for babies when i opened up my conica sand boa drawer and i noticed uh, a slug in here so if there's slugs i know there's babies. Hopefully there's babies. Today is day 56 since her post-ovulation shed. She's a conica sand boa, rough scale sand boa. And um, they usually go about day 60 um, after post-ovulation shed of having their baby. So I honestly have no idea what I'm about to find. You guys are about to find it with me. She's a small female. So on an amazing day, it'd be maybe six babies. Um, four would make me super happy. And if I get a bunch of slugs, one would make me really happy. So there's mom, a really pretty animal. She was produced by Scott Miller. She's a few years old. And uh, yeah, she's super thin right now, so I know she had her babies. So let's take a look. Actually, you know what? Let me get something. Hold on a second. Just got a quick tub to put them in. And all right. This is the best part about breeding boas. I've always considered myself more of a python guy with eggs, but boas, oh, there's one. Boas are just so much easier after they give live birth, not having to deal with the eggs. Okay, one little cute conica sand boa baby. One. Wow. I am highly, highly encouraged right now. Wow, that's a really reduced pattern one as well. That's number two. All right, that one, that one might just be staying with me. Number two, this is great. Fully encouraged here. Let's see. Three. Four. Pretty animal. Okay, so. The fact that she had more than four is crazy because she's a pretty small female. Five. Six. This is crazy, guys. Never thought she would have six. Hoping she would have six. Is that it? That might... Nope. Nope. Seven. There's unfertilized egg or unfertilized baby. Seven. Holy smokes. This is awesome. Eight. I gotta tell you, after getting nine slugs from my Amazon Basin Emerald earlier this year, I deserve some pretty good litters of stuff. So I think that might be it. Fun little treasure hunt. Looks like a total of eight babies, guys. Wow, that's a really nice litter for Conica sand bows, I'm going to tell you. So, yeah, these guys will be shedding out in about less than two weeks, and they usually get started pretty quickly on live pinkies. So, I will uh, keep you guys posted on them as they shed. I'll be making all these available, but man, what a beautiful litter of babies. One of them is definitely, where's that one? Yeah, that one right there. You can see it there crawling along the sides here. This one is definitely going to stay with me. Really unique pattern on that one. Love it. And again, here's mom. Great job, mom. All right. Off to a great day. So as I mentioned earlier, guys, you know, Keith works with a lot of northern emeralds, a lot of different species, but his passion is with bow and eye. And the thing I really admire about him is these are not easy to work with, and he's putting a lot of time and energy, not only to try to breed these animals, but to really try to figure them out and to really share that knowledge um, of what he learns about them. And I know it's something that's really important to Keith, and he wanted to talk about it a little bit today. Yeah, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Josh Hansen, who recently um, did get a clutch of Bowen's and uh, had one egg go full term. Unfortunately, the baby passed, and, um, and it's not something typically people would talk about, 
but yeah. in true Josh fashion, he shared every detail, yeah. every moment, everything that he did along the way from breeding till getting the eggs to losing that baby. And I wanted to stress how important it is to to have that mindset when you're working with a lot of these yeah. species in captivity because that's the only way we're going to learn. That's the only way that's we're going it. to establish them. And when they're no longer being able to come in from the wild, we're going to have to rely yeah. on each other with yeah. captive breeding. You know, it's funny, Keith, because uh, with uh, I always equate green tree python breeders to gamblers. Like gamblers only tell you when they win. A lot of green tree python breeders, especially posting on you know social media, only tell you when they have a great clutch. But so many people, you know, they have green tree pythons die. And what Keith is saying about Josh is, yeah, I saw the post he made on Facebook, and it was just awesome. I commented on it because, yeah, it was, uh, I'm sure, really difficult for him to post it. He's not looking for sympathy for anybody. He's, he's doing it as a learning tool. And yeah, he shared every detail with the hopes that whoever is working with Bull and I down the road can, you know, learn from his mistakes. So, and Keith, what's up with this animal? What, what, um, uh, so this animal um, was uh, from Bushmaster. I got it when uh, she was just out of the red, just turning black. I've raised her here. Um, I typically don't even hold these animals, but I felt it important enough to get her on video here to, to make a, a point about um, sharing information. Yeah. Uh, my good friend Ari also travels to uh, Papua um, and studies these animals in the wild. Um, coronavirus has put a damper on that. But um, when Ari gets out there, he's another one who shares every bit of information he can from the wild in the yep. hopes that somebody will yep. start producing these animals. Yep. I mean, Bo and I are really, really scarce these days and really difficult to, to um, obtain. And um, it's, but it's happening with all reptiles, as you guys know. I'm always stressing that. So we got to do our part in herpetoculture to share information, breed these animals, work with these animals. They're not trophies. They're not meant to be posed with on Facebook and posed with on Instagram. And hopefully these animals are getting into the right hands of people. And I think that's really important also. But again, just a real congratulations to Josh. Not on, I know yeah. you didn't have good luck with the clutch, but congrats on just uh, sharing the information. Huge the knowledge. steps that's forward. A huge step forward. So thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Hey, did everybody out there enjoy that piece with Keith McPeak? Because i got to tell you, I really enjoyed it. And Keith, thank you again for doing that with me. I thought it was great. I plan to do a lot more of those pieces in the future, like what I consider master breeders profiling certain species of animals. I think it answers a lot of questions for those of you watching out there. And again, I hope you find it really helpful. Um, and in fact, I didn't even tell you this, honey. We have another surprise guest coming up in a few weeks. I'm going to have the junior assistant to the junior manager of uh, Petco's reptile department uh, profiling uh, Carpandro. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that. And another thing, we put a lot of work into our videos and we love doing it and would really uh, show your appreciation if you can go ahead and like this video for me and subscribe to my channel. Hope you guys have fun. I hope you're learning things. And it really just gives us the energy to make more videos when I see people liking the videos and subscribing and especially comment down below. Whatever you want to comment on, I don't care. I read every single one of them, so get and comment. U.S. Ark, they need our help more than ever, okay? They do so much for us and ask so little from us. So $5 a month, guys. As always, I will put the link down below to join U.S. Ark. And that's pretty much it. Wraps up video number 27, and I will see everybody in a couple weeks. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?